Hey everyone, this is Chad Richardson from The Song Space, and I'd like to welcome you to our very first episode. Uh, this week it's going to be Stuart Crichton, producer of Kesha's Let Him Talk, and Stargazing by Kygo. Uh, please subscribe to us in the upper left-hand corner. The more subscribers we have, the more YouTube will let me do, and the more videos we can bring to you. We have a lot more interviews uh, coming up uh, in the pipe. So also go over to uh, our Instagram, The Song Space, sign up, follow us. And uh, we hope you enjoy the video. Enjoy. Okay, so, Stuart Crichton. Chad. You are the inaugural uh, interview for I'm blessed. the song space. How exciting. I was like, get Stuart! Get him, dude! Get Stuart! So, um, yeah, so this is, this is going to be like one of those things where it's kind of funny. Six months from now, where the, the 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 videos look so pro and everything, and like this is the original gorilla the original. one. I'll, I'll have lost about eighteen really, kilos like, since then. I asked you today, right? I was like, "Are you available this week?" <laughs> yeah. And you're like, "Well, I'm available now." <laughs> so <laughs> and it's LA, so it's like, okay, I can drive two hours for three miles <laughs> to get to uh, exactly. get to Stewart to do this. Um, yeah, so then it became. Uh, I just grabbed my stuff and even forgot stuff. Amazing. And came out, so... Uh, I love it. I'm, I'm the virginal thanks. interview. <laughs> All right, so we're here today to talk about the song, Let Him Talk, mm -hmm. by Kesha. Yep. That you produced. Now, the thing that's kind of cool about this song, and this first one, is that I was actually there. You were indeed. When the song happened. Absolutely. Uh, and the song happened uh, at one of my favorite things in the world, which is a song camp. Absolutely. Now, granted, this song camp was on a $32 million yacht off the south of France, because life is Slumming hard it. for people like you. Um, <laughs> but luckily, um, the king of camps, Peter Kokiard, uh, let me come. Uh, it was, uh, he says the same thing about you. He calls you the king of camps. This is how we keep our relationship. Maybe you're the king and queen of this camps. Is, this is how we keep our, <laughs> He's the queen. <laughs> I'm the top, he's the bottom. Um, <clears throat> okay. Uh, yeah, so uh, I remember I showed up. I think three days in or something, mm. and you guys had already been going. I remember, yeah. And Kesha was there, and Mitch Allen, another yep. incredible writer. Gary Taylor, Go. Taylor Parks was there. Yep. Gary Go. Gary yep. Go was there. He won, didn't Gary win the. Gary. Who won the pen? Gary and I won the pen. You guys won the pen. Yeah, right? Gary the and I won, won the golden pen. For the, for the writers of the week. <laughs> <laughs> Frankly, I thought Jamie Hartman should have got it. Jamie yeah. Hartman's song, I mean, that was yeah. stunning, though. But that, uh, Everything was, Jamie touched that week was. There were so many great songs out good. of that camp. There was a couple that Mitch did that I thought were phenomenal. Um. <clears throat> It was it was it was just a great camp. Chelsea Grimes was there, yep, obviously right. a little Taylor. superstar in the making. Taylor Parts yeah. again, a lot of good people. supreme talent, a lot of good people. Uh, yeah, and and and, and Kesha. Kesha was there. And you know, the thing that really blew my mind about Kesha was that that was my first experience uh, working with her or watching her work. And you know, there's nothing I like more than telling other people that no, 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 they're the real deal. Yeah, and they're the real deal. I've done that with like Haley Reinhardt. I remember. Uh, I published Haley, yep. and she was from American Idol, mm -hmm. and it came with that kind of like, oh, American Idol, and I would go, no, but she's the real deal. Yeah, yeah. Like, and when someone can write, uh, and not just like I'm an artist that can be in the room, like, absolutely, Kesha can fucking write. No, she, she can write. She, um, to me, having done making music since 1989, so it's like it's like literally 29 years. Yeah, she is without a doubt. Um, one of the best writers, possibly even the best writer that I've ever written with. Really? As far, yeah, as far as uh, just as far as coming up with quick ideas and and, and authentic, good good authentic ideas. ideas, good ideas. Yeah. It's like, yeah. I mean, the thing is, is if you've worked with Max Martin, Benny Blanco, Doctor Luke, and all those guys for the amount of time that she did, if you've got an ounce of talent and you work with that level of talent, you're gonna it's gonna rub on off on you if you've got that kind of skill set yeah, yeah, that yeah. you can move forward. And no, she was she was fantastic and that was the thing. Even on the on the writing camp on a thirty two million dollar yacht, which you, it's you hard. You have to go like this when you but say it. No, yeah, so. Thirty two million dollar yacht. <laughs> Cheers, you know. But the um the thing is is on those things it's quite hard to keep your work ethic up because yeah. you're actually surrounded by luxury and Fine wine, and and you're in Antibes, for instance. We were there the year before. We were in Montenegro with Peter's camp. Yeah. And uh, but Kesha was totally focused during the work day, as we all were, 
<clears throat> to write songs. And she never knew that she was going to actually release music ever again. Oh, I remember. Like, you know, because I remember of, talking to her and her going like, you know, who knows? But I think that was, I think that was part of what the magic was for her. Totally. Because she was at a period in her life that we all kind of know and remember what it was. And people well, know what she was going through at the time. And I remember every single song, it was like, like the shit was pouring out of her. Absolutely. And I think there was almost this like abandon because she didn't know whether it was ever going to get released. Totally. So she's like, I can fucking do what I want. She was I'm loving music gonna, again. I'm I think that's the thing. I'm just going to say whatever I want, do whatever yeah. I want, and just, and just let it out. Yeah. And it created like such amazing music. Like I, I remember one or two songs that it's just like, and you know, it's like a camp's, you do it, you may never hear the song ever again. Absolutely. And that someone else wrote, right? But, and, but you remember, you're like, God, that song that they did, that da 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 was da 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 The last night on that camp, uh, when, when Peter, at Peter's camp, he always plays the songs at the end of the camp. Yeah. And on the, on the yacht camps, he got the, the crew of the yacht on both ones to, to do Judge. the... Who were like X Factor judges. <laughs> yeah. And it was fantastic. Like Captain Gary was the... <laughs> was, it, was like Simon Cowell. And it was great, you know. And, and um, they would listen to every song, but everybody was dancing. Yeah. And yeah. and it was like a real party atmosphere. There was, you know... I don't think I've heard on any of the camps, like the ballet camps uh, and the two uh, yacht camps that I've been mm. on, I've never heard a bad song. Probably my own on the very first ballet camp, Peter would say that my songs. I, I I'd really let myself go, uh, but the uh, well, it was I, it was it was it was a real uh, wake up call for me. The first I ballet think, camp. I think there's a bit of a phenomenon that occurs that Peter definitely has at his camps because of, I think it's a big part of it is the producer he chooses. Because I see, I've seen him at different camps that I've done. I know it's different things that how they work in different ones, and the, the yacht camp was a perfect example of it. There are. And there are producers that I think are up and coming that will go to a camp and they'll go in, <clears throat> excuse me, they'll go in and they'll do a song and it might even become like, oh, this is really cool, let's follow the song. Yeah. But then there are people that have gone to the next level who they're going, they're going, look, I want to write hit songs because I want to get a cut, exactly. et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And every song they do, they're working on it to be a hit song. Mm. So even if it becomes, because <clears throat> I've seen this, where a producer will like veer off, in my mind, what could go from a hit song to, oh, we're following the song, it's so cool. Yeah. Because this idea is so cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's like, no, 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 no. No, no, keep back. going. If yeah. you do this show. Yeah. And so people like you, when you go to camps, and every producer, I think of that Bali camp, their mission statement is to do something incredible and creative and collaborative, but the end goal is to write a hit song. Absolutely. That will get cut. But, and, and, and also... it's a very different mentality. On that on that same note, it's funny because there was the, the, the writing camp uh, in Bali where John Elysia was that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, and he came up to me after the first day and he went, oh man, you know, I don't think I'm cut out for this because I'm only doing guitar vocal. I don't I don't make tracks. I record. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's he's done John Mayer. He's done yeah. Uh, this is Willie, Willie Nelson's son. I forget his name now. Lucas Nelson, I think it's. Anyway, it's. And I said John, and he played me the song. I think his and song I went, is called Wee Willie Nelson. We Willie Nelson. We Willie Nelson. <laughs> In fact, yeah, was that running <laughs> through the town with a candlelight? Kind of the um, but I remember, and and he said, and I said, let me hear your song, and it was this beautiful song, uh, and it was a guitar vocal, and it sounded amazing. And well, we all know. I, if I said, Dude. we all know if something's good. I said, yeah. you don't need to worry about tracks. I said, I'm doing tracks, yeah, uh, because that's what I do. I said, okay, so. We were talking about um, the producers that were there at the camp, uh, all the high-level quality and stuff. And then when I was talking about, one of the things that blew my mind about you is that you're one of the fastest uh, and most efficient track makers that I'd ever seen. Like, you can build a track in a half an hour that I've seen producers build in, like, four or five hours. Mm. And, you know, you've got the writers behind, you know, trying to come up with the lyrics and the melody and stuff. And it must be incredible to have somebody who can just, like, lay it down at the speed you can. So why don't you kind of take me through... When you guys were doing uh, Let Him Talk, uh, why don't well, you just kind of take me through how you built the track, so how the song came about, and, and, and... Originally, I think what I got, I, I literally got up an arpeggiated bass, like a dum 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 dum, a 16, 16 note arpeggiated Juno bass. And uh, that's how the track started. It was like dum 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 like that. And then uh, it was James Newman and Kesha and I that were uh, doing that song. And uh, James is obviously a great vibey guy. Kesha was, you know, she was in uh, a great mood and 
on form. I think that might have even been the first day. I've got a no, feeling. No, it was the first day no? because it was written when I was there, and I didn't get there to about two days in. Okay. Yeah. I, uh, well, if that, oh, do you know it what? It might have that, been day three. I think. Uh, probably, yeah. yeah, probably right. Yeah. But I just remember, and then Kesha's going, oh, "This is amazing," and then she, uh, she, all the way through, she's going, "Oh, can you make it sound a bit more like Led Zeppelin?" And uh, kind of, uh, can you make it more like rock drums and and whatever? And I was like, "Yeah, of course," you know. And as much as a laptop setup can do that. And the fact that we, uh, I think Jamie came down and played some scratch guitars on it for us. Yeah. But right from the, the get-go, she said, oh, my friend's Eagles of Death Metal will... Uh, oh, really? Yeah. So that wasn't like... She, no, I no. That was like post, post, post. Oh, no, 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 no. She idea. said straight away. She that from the beginning. She said, she oh. goes, oh, my goodness. She goes, they'll come in and do a demo in this with us. And, and um, but that obviously was a much further, that was like, Two years later, or yeah. two and a half years later, yeah. uh, which was the, but the basically we, yeah, we come up with the, the pulse bass. I added in some kind of I dare say eighties kind of drum uh, programming, and it was very much about the melodies and about a cheeky lyric, which is which Kesh is, you know, really great with and James Jamie uh, James sorry James Newman doing. Like uh, a lot of chants and kind of big gang vocal kind of stuff. I remember the last day when we had the party and all the songs were played, and we were all singing the chanting. <laughs> the, the thing Ooh, uh, I we remember all, the, we were all singing that. Like, the, the, uh, the the one thing that was, because we were in France is a bit where she counts and and she goes on de trois four, like, and, and, <laughs> and and we as as simple humor as that is, we were pissing ourselves yeah. like. Because I think by that point, I think we'd probably started sinking some fine French wine down by that point. Yeah. But uh, it was, uh, yeah, loads of fun. And again, just it's amazing how a buoyant session can, you know, be a fun session. Every, you know, I'm not saying every session has to be fun as such, but I mean, uh, it was a fun session. Do, I mean, you, do you remember? Like, do you remember the song coming? Obviously, the track came quickly for you, but do you remember the song coming quickly as the well? The chorus or? definitely came very quickly. I remember that she started singing the chorus fairly much straight away, um, and then James had this idea, which there was a kind of discussion of whether that should be the post or whether the the thing Kesha was singing should be the post, but um, ended up sticking with Kesha's idea and then James's idea, yeah, and then. Uh, that came really quickly. I remember we started tracking vocals almost probably within an hour or, a, or two hours into just writing the song. And it doesn't seem like from, I mean, from me hearing the finished product, from me hearing the finished product to what I remember on the boat uh, in France. Yeah. <laughs> um, it doesn't seem like there was a massive difference. Like, I mean, no. apart from like the boys putting some no, no, well, that's some, the thing. Uh, no. on it. Well, the, the, drums, the drums were still in there, but we got... Uh, uh, drum, uh, Jarma, the, the drummer from Eagles of Death Metal, he um, uh, put the the drums down, and then yeah, but uh, David Catching, he was the the guitarist, the guy with the long beard out of uh, Eagles of Death Metal, yeah. lovely guy. He was uh, absolutely great. Came in, um, and then Jesse Hughes, the singer, came in, played some weird guitar and and did some bvs and and sung a bit in the, the bridge section which was it was a crazy session uh we started at 11 o'clock and i think they were all drunk by seven o'clock and i was finished my song and then drew uh pearson came in to record his song yeah which was uh i think he was recording uh i don't think it was women he was recording it was the other song boogie feet i think it's called on the okay. album and uh and uh Say it again Boogie feet. Okay. Boogie feet. The, uh, <laughs> the, uh... The, you don't know uh, that this shit's going no, on. No, of course. No, of course. <laughs> My but, head's just like... Oh, no, don't be silly. No, I don't mind that. But the, uh, the thing with... Fuck you, Chad Richardson! But, <laughs> but Drew, Drew, I remember, uh, came in, and I'd never met Drew, and I went, Drew, nice to meet you. And, uh... I literally handed the studio over to him for his session, yeah. and I, I literally handed over the Eagles of Death Metal, and I mean... Oh, my God. And they were all drunk, and... And uh, he managed to do a really great job, wow. you know, getting around that. Wow. But, um, yeah, so, but, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, whenever I listen to the demo that we did in, in the boat, in, in, or the boat, 
in France yeah. and the finished version. They're very similar, you know. So, you know that there's a good there's a good thing to chat about for a second. So tell me for someone like you who's at the level that you're at where <clears throat> when I say at the level you're at, I, I'm I'm basically meaning someone that, that does get cuts. Yeah. I mean, you know. Yeah, yeah. Ninety five percent of the producers and the writers in LA yeah. might never get a cut. No, yeah. You know, and that's you know what hopefully the song space is all about yeah. is helping people get to that next Absolutely. level. Absolutely. But like tell me like tell me how because I think that I think I've seen a lot of times with young producers, they get really hyper precious about their original production, and they've killed opportunities because they draw this line in the sand about, mm -hmm. you know, how precious are you about the original compared to what happens? Bringing other people in, like for you, is it? Look, I just want to get it cut. Let's bring it to the end of the line. Yeah. Or or are there lines that you have where you go, no, no? Oh no, this. this is I think, I think on that one, and it's a really interesting question. I think because. I think, especially having moved to LA three years ago, yeah. there's there's like almost like two or three different uh, train of thought that I have whenever I'm writing or producing a song now. Mm -hmm. uh, like the Kygo song that we did, Stargazing, for instance, was a piano vocal. Yeah. And a lot of cuts that I've had recently have been off of piano vocals because you're selling a song yeah. to a DJ yeah, yeah. or whatever. Then there's the more developed... Um, things that we're doing, like for instance, uh, Dave Gibson, James Newman and myself wrote a song with Tony Braxton that just went to number one in the Billboard Dance, the remixes did anyway, a chart, uh, and it's on our album. And it's a kind of more developed piano vocal thing with a, yeah. with a sl small drum beat going on, mm -hmm. but it's very intimate. <clears throat> and then there's the other things where uh, they're almost like full productions after I've finished a day in the studio. Yeah. But um, I don't know if Precious is the one, because like, the great thing with having Peter and Lucas at Milk and Honey in the last three years... Those are your managers. Yeah, yeah, they're yeah. my managers. And, and they've been brutally honest. Honest. You know, and you kind of need that. Because, Which is a lost art in our industry. Well, honestly, you, because, honest, you know... Honestly, well, honesty is a lost It is, lost because art. I think a lot of people can blow smoke up your tailpipe and... Yeah. And it just it, it does no good for anybody, yep. you know. So, but the thing is, is like, uh, I've got, I've I've had a full production song where maybe Lucas or Peter have said, "Oh, take everything out and just strip it down to the piano vocal or start yeah. again." Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and that's that's been a learning curve for me in my in my later years in in doing music. Obviously, the length of time I've been doing it, but uh, I think it's another thing that. Uh, I don't think you can be too precious. Is the answer? I think I think having a yes, I think having a yes man as a producer or as a writer is the worst thing you can have. It, it's a nightmare. Well, it must be. As I say it again, though, the one thing, the one, the, the the horror story that I hear from most of the time is people who don't get sent the, the demos until eight weeks later or twelve weeks later. As soon as everybody's leaving here and we're waving goodbye. I'm emailing everybody what we've done. I know that, that from the past of working with you. But that, and I just think though the thing is, is that the 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 feel good factor that we all have whenever you finish the song, whether it's a yeah. great song, a good song, or a not so good song, everybody in the room deserves to have that gratification at the end of the day yeah. that you go. I I believe anyway that you go. Hey, it might it's not finished, but there's that's what we did. Yeah. So at least you can then listen, and then they come back to you and go, could you maybe do this? Could you maybe do that? You know, and I think that. That's uh, that's a, a big thing for me. That uh, so probably that's where a lot of the speed factor comes from. Yeah. I would like to think that uh, the I don't uh, the quality doesn't get interrupted by the speed that I do as yeah, well. No, that's, I, I, I think that's the that's thing. That's that, honestly, that's what's impressive, though. You know, I, I think that's that's the twenty nine years of experience. I think there where. I'm I'm always trying to better myself while I'm doing this. I always say that this is my guitar. Yeah. You know, it's like, you know, if you've got somebody sitting at the guitar or at the piano, that's that's their thing. My instrument is is doing this and crafting it into hopefully different genres that I, I like to, you know, think that I can do proficiently, you know. Why don't you, why don't you just because you mentioned it, um, <clears throat> I know a lot of people watching this will, will know this song and love it. Mm. Um, why don't you quickly talk a little bit to me about um, the Kygo song? And how that came about. You wrote that with... With uh, Jamie Hartman and Justin Jesso. Jamie Hartman, of course, 
who will be on a future episode. Yeah, uh, he will be. Who wrote Human, Rag and Bone Man. Human, Rag and Bone Man. He's won Song of the Year in the UK, right? He did for the Brit Awards. But yeah. he's, Jamie's written numerous songs Brilliant over writer. the years. He's, he's uh, Brilliant writer. Jennifer Hudson, Christina Aguilera. Yeah, he's amazing. We've got a whole lot of stuff, exciting stuff coming out over the next few months. And he's, he's one of my favourite writers ever to write with. And, again. and like just a... Good, good guy, guy. Good, guy. <laughs> good, good guy, right? Good wholesome family guy, man. And you know, and he's been watching this going, "Wow, well, man!" No. <laughs> first episode is the nut fest. For actually, he doesn't talk like that. I don't know no, no. what I'm doing that voice. He'd, he'd probably say sorry. He'd go, "Sorry, man. Um, uh, sorry, it's true. Um, you, uh, <laughs> but he, uh, yeah, we 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 came in and that uh, we Jamie just sat sat down at the piano and we started jamming out and then literally it was just a piano vocal and we we. We all get involved in the lyric and that one and in the melody. Um, and then literally put a sub bass in the choruses where we thought the choruses or the, yeah. the choruses were. Yeah. And it was probably about two minutes twenty long because we just did the verse, pre chorus and chorus, and then a one bar turnaround and then verse, second verse, same pre chorus and same uh, uh, chorus, and then sent it to Robin Adomi at the RCA. Uh, oh, that was Rob. Who loved it. it. No, no, it was actually, but no, but he loved it, but it yeah. was hitting uh, Baradia from Phrase Differently that got the cut. Because he was, he was a very like, good friend. No, him. well, so so basically, <laughs> but it was like a, it was a real, everybody knew there was something special about it, but Hinton yeah. really uh, went the extra mile and, and, and got that. Shakespeare. Absolutely, no, but he's, <laughs> uh, he's, he's a, he's a, a great guy. And, um, Hidden had the, the first camp I ever went to that I ever participated in nine years ago mm. was Hitton's. Is that right? In a place called Skara in Sweden. Middle of Sweden. Didn't know Hitton. Well, I've got a funny... I, mean, I, went, I went to tell the whole story, but I, I w was introduced to Hitton and some, I thought somebody had said knitting. And, <laughs> and, and I thought that Hitton was knitting Sonny. <laughs> and so I was going, hey man, I'm a big fan of all your work. Oh, that's and, awesome. and I walked off and, and I could I was seeing him at the bar, kind of still kind of looking at me as <laughs> kind of fused, yeah. you know, you love my work kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, I thought he was somebody else. So. And then he got a place and then it just... <laughs> Yeah, no, that's it. Took off, but it was a piano vocal. It was literally piano vocal, and uh, uh, and then Kygo came in with the the drop, and and that's the thing, you know. I, I remember a producer once said to me, and if he recognizes who he is on this, sorry, <laughs> I won't say your name, but a producer who I, I love, I really love. Him. He called me up once, and he said, "Look, I'm going to see this track I just did with XXX mm. artist, pretty well known artist," mm. and he sent me the track, and I played, he played it for me, and I'm like brutally honest mm. with people and I was like well dude you know I like it but the like the hook just isn't I don't hear it yet mm. right and he said to me he goes well you know when, once all the production's in it's good and I went whoa whoa whoa, whoa. Okay, <laughs> I'm gonna stop you right there because if if you think building the production is what's gonna turn something into a hook you're wrong Absolutely. because it's just got to be a piano and a melody. That's where the hook's got to be there. And again, if it's not there now. It's not going to be totally. There by throwing and again, more stuff that's that's something thing. that very much Lucas Keller has uh, taught me. Yeah, uh, is about the he, he'll turn around and go, "Just give me a piano vocal, man," because yeah. these DJs will they'll they'll do it. Yeah, they'll if, do you, if you if you spoon feed them the track, sometimes they'll hate it. You know, and and equally, the production sometimes can mask an average song. Yeah. If the production is great and it's got a great drop or whatever, then it might just be an average song. Yeah, you know, I gotta say, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna get you now to just kind of I don't know, give a piece of advice or something. So yeah. You can think about that while I'm rambling for a second. Mm. But even just doing this right now, like what is amazing to me is that I've just realized that like this whole idea for the song space and what I want to do is about helping other writers. But I've like literally just realized what a great time I'm gonna have. Having gonna, these conversations. You're gonna have the best time. I love them. I no, love you, these conversations. This is the thing. So, uh, I guess you know we talk a little bit about, and this is one of the things I really want to stress to people in this, is you know I see the song space as being something for a lot of up and coming writers, mm -hmm. learning things that they couldn't learn in school, mm -hmm. learning things in the real world sense from people that have really done it. So, yep. uh, I'm gonna put you on the spot and say if you could give one piece of advice to young producers right now, new producers moving to LA, since you did it yourself, mm -hmm. uh, what what would that be? Oof. I don't know. I'd love I'm to full say of piss and vinegar. I, know, I'd love I just not, got off the bus no, on the I'd, plane. I'd I love, arrived in LA. <laughs> I'm going to make it happen in six months. And Stuart Creighton says... It's funny, and I'd love to think of 
to say something really prolific, but I just think that that it's so easy for people to get caught up in in trying to make a hit record every day. Yeah. And I think the thing is, is you've got to go into work every day thinking that you've got the capability of making a hit record every day. Yeah. Even if you've never had a hit record. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise there's no real point. But the thing is, is the the reality is, is that you're probably not going to write a hit every day. Obviously, I mean, you know, Max Martin doesn't write hits every well, day. Well, people think he does, right? They think everything. But he does that thing goal, where, but where it's like, but you've got, the radio you've got to have that uh, wherewithal where you're going in there and you're thinking, I'm just going to give it my best every yeah. single day. And th the the thing is, is always where there's a downward curve, there's always an upward curve. And I, I, that's another thing that I always say to a lot of the younger people where they're maybe in the doldrums if they've had a hit and then two years later they still haven't had another hit. Yeah. It'll all, it comes like that all the time. You know, you started, this, you started this off with something that really struck me that to me was very Nashville. You called it work. You said when you go into work mm. and that, <clears throat> that is something that is a very Nashville thing. They see it as going to work every day. Yep. And there's a part of you that has to see it that way Absolutely. if you want to survive. Because if you just see it as the glitz and the glamour and the boom, boom, boom and all this kind of stuff, you're going to lose sight of the fact that it takes work, it takes dedication. Mm -hmm. You know, especially most guys, you know, our age, there's families involved. There's yep. like, there's, there's more of an immediacy than, than, than before. But having that work ethic, showing up on time, running the, the session properly, running the session professionally. The word gets out when you do that. Oh, of course. The I mean, you can have... Small town. Listen, you have, small you have town. so much fun doing it. Yeah. It's not to say that you don't have fun. It's but that, the world. But the work ethic... <laughs> the work ethic... Exactly, you know. Yeah. It's, it's, I always think that I'm blessed every day to do what I do yeah. for a living. And I sometimes call it my hobby. I sometimes call it work. I, but whatever it is, I come in here every day and I see my little twinkle light lights going on. Um, back to the first day that I started doing what I do, I've still got that passion every day to do, even in the bad and the good and the up and the down times, having that passion to do that, okay. you know. One little fun story before you go, because mm. I was just thinking about it, uh, and, and camps are going to be a big part of the song space. Mm. And tell uh, the people out there what happened when you tried to come to my camp in Nova Scotia. What, <laughs> ha what happened to you? <laughs> So this is I, a lesson learned for dude. I'll tell you what, producers. man. I I am so, so I I turned up at the airport. I met uh, Tushar Apta. We were checked in, and then we went through TSA through the security. And at six thirty in the morning, we're half asleep, and they tell me to take my computer out of my computer bag. So I put my bag into one case, uh, one uh, bin, and then I not the the computer in the other one. Half asleep, I put the two bins on top of each other. I go to put my shoes back on and then I walk on, leaving the computer in the middle of the two bins. Yeah. Totally didn't know this yeah. until I found out when I got off my plane in Montreal waiting to connect to Halifax and the, the chap at the next uh, security said, uh, excuse me, sir, could you take your computer out of your bag? And I said, no problem. Oh, <laughs> where's my computer? Oh, oh. And then it just, it was like, it was, and the rest is all where I had to phone you up and say, Chad, I can't come, I don't have a computer, and I need to get back to LAX because my wife's phoning them up and they're not answering. And I mean, James, 19 hours later, I'm back in LA. So I've done the full round trip up to Montreal, Toronto, Toronto to LA, and I go to the gate that I left from, and the guy said, you don't have a hope in hell to find your computer it'll be in lost and found if it's anywhere and i said please is there a, do you have a safe here that the day and he goes yeah we do and I, I i then started pulling things like i've been working with kesha lately and i've been doing you know working with x y and z and uh and he went okay come on over here you've got to sign this disclaimer thing and they opened up the safe and it was like the holy grail there was my laptop 19 hours later wow. in the safe. And you <laughs> yeah, called me and you're like, Chad, I, I don't know what to say. I can't call you. Do you want the bad news or the bad news? <laughs> it was, it was. <laughs> and I was so gutted because uh, that was uh, uh, oh, a fact that Brian, eventful, was, Brian Lee was on that camp. An eventful camp. Yeah, exactly, that, Brian. That, yeah, that was an eventful camp. Brian Lee, man, the, the infamous Brian Lee. And, and Tushar Apta, who's, again, yeah. uh, 
Yeah. Uh, an incredible talent. And I think Fred Rowe came and filled in for That's him. right. And Fred Who's Rowe's another boy, legend. Fred Actually, you know what? Uh, Fred Rowe did the, the original camp the year before, and there's a new cut on the uh, Kumikota record. Oh, I mean, yes, I think I saw yeah. that. It's number two or something yeah, in, in, in Fred Japan. Fredro's got a song he did at, the, at that camp on that. Fredro, so. king of Japan, man. He's always getting cuts in Japan. I love him, man. I love him. <laughs> Anyways, uh, Stuart, I really appreciate this. I appreciate a having lot, you as a friend, Chad. A lot. And uh, we'll uh, we'll do this again in like six months or something and, and revisit. And, and maybe it won't be as gorilla. But maybe this will be, I don't know. Maybe this will be good. Like, That's maybe, the new thing, man. Gorilla is the new profession. You will see, though, when you see it, that I've, I've purposely made you look really good. And I'm really low rent. <laughs> to like... <laughs> out of like respect you're gonna look great your lighting is good you're, I mean you look you, you really look good and I'm just kinda like you know all thrown together but anyways thanks Stuart bless Appreciate you pal alright man good on you man and uh, we'll see you next time exactly alright cheers